Have you ever heard the tale of the Assassin's Creed Unity? Twas a good game, ruined by the greed of one Microsoft. Hello! I like money! And that created the fans' very own revolution. Tonight we will become... A revolution. Assassin's Creed Unity has always had a special place in my heart. It's by far my most played Assassin's Creed game, and my family has some pretty big French roots. In fact, I just went there last month. Not only that, but I was one of those people who really enjoyed the gameplay, thought the world and setting was incredible, and actually thought the story was quite underrated. Obviously, I think we all know the story of this game by now, the one with so much wasted potential. It was so ambitious, but Ubisoft rushed it out the door, and it really least buggy and unfinished. The game is definitely much better today, however it's still quite buggy and never really reached its full potential. The bugs, mixed with tons of technical issues including poor performance on PC and consoles, along with some of the marketing that caused the game to be overhyped. Not only that, but I remember they straight up lied about one of the features they were advertising to be in the game that was never in the final product. Assassinating the guards inspired the crowd to storm the palace by force. This kind of situation surrounding a game on release may sound a bit familiar. Kind of like Cyberpunk, but on a smaller scale, and well before it became more usual for games to be released buggy. Ubisoft's reputation took a massive hit in 2014 with Unity and the whole E3 controversy with Watch Dogs, and you can definitely make the argument that Unity is one of the reasons Ubisoft would eventually soft reboot the series with Origins and go in the new direction we are in today. However, despite all that, I love Unity. It's so much better to play today, and it brings me great joy to see many people finally giving this game a second chance and changing their opinions on it. In a lot of ways, Unity feels like the last true Assassin's Creed game, which is also probably why so many people now have such a good opinion on it today, especially for those who don't like the new formula for Assassin's Creed. To me, Unity felt like the natural evolution of the original formula, kind of like how Assassin's Creed 3 tried to innovate on the classic formula of AC1 to Revelations. Unity was the first next-gen Assassin's Creed game, and it truly felt like they kept what made the original formula special and the identity of the series intact while trying to innovate and improve on it in many ways, especially with the gameplay. And of course the graphics, which we're definitely going to talk about more in a bit, but my goodness, what a beautiful game. But anyways, I was very excited to replay the entirety of AC Unity for this video. Yes, I still play it quite often, when I need some gameplay for my videos, and I've made a decent amount of videos on this game. Actually, the first video that ever blew up on my channel was my money guide for Unity. Hello everyone, today I'll be showing you how to get unlimited money in Assassin's Creed Unity. So let's get right into it. So it's special to me for many reasons. But it's actually been around three or four years since I've actually replayed the game in its entirety with the main story and everything. And that's mostly because for some reason, Unity only allows you to have one save file. I have no idea why that fancy next gen and you can't even have more than one save file. So rather than have to delete my save that I put well over 100 hours into, I decided to create a new Ubisoft account and a very kind Ubisoft representative actually provided me with a code for Unity so I could replay it again. So I started up a new game and delved back into the French Revolution. So I think it's only right if we start by talking about Unity's presentation, because like I said earlier, this game looks so good, especially for its age. Can you believe Unity will be a decade old in two years? That's so hard to process, especially since it looks like a game that could have come out this year. Yeah, this game's very purdy. The lighting, the detail, I'm seriously impressed with Ubisoft Montreal's efforts and attention to detail, considering this game only had three years of development. I mean, sure, the new games like Valhalla and Odyssey may look better in terms of visual fidelity, but the worlds in those games are nowhere near as dense and detailed as France in Unity. However, a big drawback to such a gorgeous game, especially at the time, was the technical side of things. Unity was a very difficult game to run well back in 2014, but now with new 
new modern hardware, it ran like a dream on my PC, and it even is now playable in 60 FPS on the Xbox Series X and X. Granted, there's still lots of occasional visual bugs and issues. Of course, the pop-in isn't great. And for a while, I had some weird artifacting in the game, which eventually got sorted out once I played with the settings a bit. But now that the game is able to run on most PCs at solid frame rates, it's a much better experience and allows you to really admire how great it looks. I had the pleasure of playing on 4K and I couldn't get over how well the graphics have aged. Unity also has a really underrated soundtrack in my opinion. That's one thing I feel you can almost always count on with most Ubisoft games, especially Assassin's Creed games, is the soundtrack will always be on point. I love the vibe the music gives off in this game, it's kind of hard to explain, but just fits with the game's identity so well. It has lots of range too, from the fun, upbeat chase music, and the dark, intense action music. Now of course I have to dedicate a section of this video to talking about the bugs because it's a very common topic with Unity and likely what most people will think about when talking about the game. Like I said earlier, the game is far better than it was back in 2014, but it's still quite buggy to this day, or at least a lot more so than your usual Assassin's Creed game. Don't get it twisted, the bugs aren't cyberpunk on launch day level. During my recent playthrough, I didn't encounter too many, but some were so frequent and game-breaking enough that I couldn't simply ignore them. This may or may not bother you depending on your tolerance level of bugs. The thing with AC Unity is it may simply decide to just not work whenever it wants. It really isn't that bad though, I may be making it a bigger deal than it is, but the game is by no means perfectly polished in 2022, and it can still be janky and frustrating sometimes, which is something you unfortunately will have to put up with when playing Unity. Again, and I enjoy this game so much that I'm often able to look past the bugs and enjoy the game for what it is, but I understand if it's just too frustrating to deal with for some people. All in all, Unity is definitely one of those games that has benefited from father time, and while its visuals may have been a bit overambitious for its time, they can now be properly appreciated the way it was meant to in 2022. I absolutely love the French Revolution setting. Like I said earlier, I'm French and I even speak it fluently. Oui, oui, monsieur, ça va. Yeah, that's right, and check this out. Oui, oui, oui. Yeah, yeah, that's all I got. It's okay, my mom already sees me as a failure anyway. Okay, mother doesn't like it when I joke. By the way, how do you guys like my new profile picture? I really like it. It's an adorable widow Ezio. Okay, sorry. Anyway, uh, where was I? Right, right, right. The setting, the setting. I really enjoy the setting. During the revolution, one of the most violent periods of time in our world's history, and seeing many iconic characters, locations, and events take place throughout the story is really cool, and cements why I love Assassin's Creed to begin with. The history. It's the perfect setting for an assassin to run around and create some mayhem, and they did a good job showing the Brotherhood during this time period. The immersion and atmosphere of the open world is also incredible. The sheer number of NPCs roaming France's streets or protesting and rioting in front of landmarks. It really helps you immerse yourself in this world and feel like you've taken a time machine back in time. What helps is also the insane amount of detail and historical accuracy poured into this world by Ubisoft Montreal. I know they actually visited a lot of these locations in real life and scan them to get the world as accurate as possible, and they did a phenomenal job. And I know because I've been to a lot of these places in the game in real life. It was pretty hilarious because everyone was so excited to see all these historical landmarks and where famous historical figures used to live, while I was pointing out things I recognized from Assassin's Creed Unity. I'm not even kidding, when I was in Versailles, everyone was freaking out like, yo, this is where Marie Antoinette and King Louis lived, blah blah. While I was like, yo, that's where Shay killed Charles Dorian. Oh my god, and that's where little Arno stole the apples. And that's where Monsieur de la Serre was stabbed through the neck. And that's where I assassinated Siver. This is where the underground entrance to the Brotherhood is. That's that one tower that Arno scaled during World War II. Oh, oh, that's where the king was executed? Pfft. 
lame. This is where Arnold confronts Germain and has to choose between vengeance or saving his love, Elise. Yeah, as you can imagine, I was annoying my family so much. I literally pointed out the window I snuck into at Versailles where you have to sneak into the party in real life and absolutely nobody cared, but I kept doing it. They even nailed how the buildings and rooftops look. Paris still has a lot of these old buildings from back then, so that was so awesome to see how much detail the developers put into this game. Not only that, but so many buildings have interiors or unique architecture and designs. I can't believe they only had three years to create such a large yet dense and detailed world. It's not just the buildings either. The clothing you see on the NPCs and characters is very accurate, aside from the flashy assassin robes, of course. And the guard uniforms are also very accurate. The world design as well is what arguably makes it one of the best open worlds of the series. The world is so well designed for parkour. It makes parkour feel prevalent, useful, and encouraged. Something that I feel is missing from the more empty, large open worlds of the newer games. The parkour pathing that allows you to go smoothly from building to building and rooftop to rooftop, and more subtle things like the lifts that allow you to quickly scale up to the top of a structure. Like sure, this game could have great parkour, but it doesn't mean much when the world isn't built and designed for it. The verticality, tight spaces, and dense crowds just make for the ultimate assassin's playground and a big reason why parkour feels amazing in Unity. However, However, a really underrated aspect of this game that I don't believe gets enough praise is the side content. This game has some really decent quality side content, and while sure there is some of the typical Ubisoft copy and paste content with the assassination contracts and escort missions, there's a lot of really fun and unique stories and missions in there as well. The Paris stories are great, they feel more fleshed out, they have stories attached to them, and you get to experience all the weird and crazy the French Revolution has to offer. Just as an example, a standout to me was a psychic lady who had Arno just going around killing criminals because she claimed they would do something bad in the near future. And they wish me harm. I have seen my enemies in a dream. I do find it a bit odd that Arno is mostly mute during a lot of the side content, including the Paris stories. We of course know he talks and has personality in the main story, so why is he often mute in the side quests, especially when there's some crazy stuff going on? It's really odd. Don't get me wrong, he still occasionally has a one-liner or remark here and there, but it's completely inconsistent and there's a lot of missions where he doesn't say a word. I suppose it's a minor gripe, but it would have benefited the stories, I think, if Arno interacted with the situations and characters more. Like when Napoleon tells him to go spy on this guy who he thinks is in love with his fiance, Arno should at least say, okay, or I'll get on that, or something, instead of just this awkward silence. I suspect that Captain Bernadotte has fallen in love with my fiance, and I cannot abide the thought. As I must dine with her this evening, I would ask that you search Bernadotte's house near the Palais Royal and determine his feelings on the matter. <laughs> It's not just the Paris stories though, there's some other quality side content as well. There's Cafe Theatre, which is like the hub system that used to be quite a regular thing in the older Assassin's Creed games, where you can renovate it and complete missions for the cafe to increase its revenue and earn more money for yourself. I really like these systems in AC games, and Cafe Theatre is one of my favorites, especially because it has side content connected to it, and there's plenty of little cool places and hidden areas to explore. I also really like how you can see it visibly changed from all the renovations. There's plenty of other cafes scattered across the world as well that you can renovate and take missions from as well. It's a really enjoyable system for me personally and a great way to make a lot of money in Unity. There's the Nostradamus Enigmas, which are these riddles scattered throughout Paris meant to really force you to explore and investigate the world and use your brain. Finding the riddles for these was really satisfying for me. It actually made me feel smart when I discovered the more difficult ones and it's a really really great way to force you to check the databases and learn more about the history and geography of the world. Some of them are really challenging, but you do get a cool outfit if you complete them all, which I tried to go for, but I'll admit, I gave up because it was just taking far too long, because you need so many to get Thomas de Carnelian's assassin robes. Again, it's very cool that you can actually unlock that though, since he's the assassin in the introduction period of the game, and was the mentor of the French Brotherhood during the 1300s. It's kind of like Altair's outfit 
outfit with a different color scheme, which I think is cool. Shout out to those of you who grinded for it. I suppose I could have just looked up all the riddle locations if I really wanted the outfit, but that felt like cheating to me and my pride wouldn't allow it. So the completionist in me had to admit defeat on that one. But there's even more side content. There are the rifts where you have to collect data through parkour challenges. You can also compete against other online players and try to beat their score. And for completing those, you get Altair's outfit. However, probably my favorite side content in the game were the murder mysteries. I can't believe I never did these before in my other playthroughs. They're awesome. You get to enact your detective skills, look at evidence, search for clues, question suspects, and then look through all your evidence and decide who you're going to accuse of the murder. Some are pretty easy, but others can be fairly difficult and again require you to actually think and use your brain. I like when side content or games in general make me actively think, and I really got to feel like a detective in these missions. You even get a better reward for accusing the correct perpetrator on the first try, so that gives proper incentive to ensure you're accusing the right person. Granted, I wish the awards were a little better, but I still really enjoyed these. That kind of brings me to one of my biggest issues with the side content though, and that's the rewards. The rewards are so poorly balanced, like why am I getting 3,500 livre for running 30 meters and assassinating a single enemy, while I only get 500 for doing a 10 to even 20 minute Paris story. It's so odd, again it's not a major thing, but it does kind of affect one's incentive to go out and do this side content. There's then of course the co-op missions and heists, which I'll touch on more later when I talk about co-op. But side content aside, I love the system with the crowd events in Unity, killing criminals, tackling thieves, giving beggars some money, protecting civilians, or scaring bullies. It makes you feel like the revolution's own vigilante. It forces you to actively pay attention in the world, and these events happen randomly, giving more life and believability to the city. You also get decent rewards for completing a set, so the incentive is definitely there for the crowd events. And as I'm sure you can guess, the world is chock full of collectibles and all that. Again, the rewards for collectibles seem really minute in comparison to the amount of time and effort they take to collect. On my main account in my other playthrough, I actually collected all the cockades just to get the color black for my assassin gear. That's kind of insane, and I didn't care enough this time around to go and do that. Overall, I adore Unity's open world. It's easily one of, if not my favorite open world of the entire series. The immersion, the design for parkour, the detail and historical accuracy, and the plethora of quality side content makes it incredible to explore and truly the perfect hunting grounds for an assassin during the revolution. Unity's parkour is perhaps one of the most talked about points when it comes to Unity. A lot of people really love this game's parkour system. It looks incredible, for starters, the animations and the expression in the movement is by far the best of any Assassin's Creed game. It also introduced downward parkour, even though that technically existed already. However, the parkour can be very unresponsive and feel very janky and hard to control at times, especially for those who don't know all the advanced movements you can make to make the parkour feel better. So sometimes Arno can look really cool like this, and sometimes he can look like this. Remember, Unity has a special feature in its parkour, where your inputs are not commands, but mere suggestions. Arno has a mind of his own, and he can be sure stubborn getting him to do what you want. But the main reasons the parkour in this game is enjoyable is because of its wonderful animations and the parkour pathing and design of the world that makes parkour feel encouraged and essential. I also love how they give you a manual jump button. It sounds like such a minor thing, but it makes such a difference, which is painfully obvious when you try Syndicate's parkour, which removed manual jumping for some reason. I don't know about you guys, but when this game first came out, I would go to the park and try to replicate Arno's parkour moves. I'm sure it looked horrible, but I never felt so cool in my life. I'm telling you, if you gave me a hood and hidden blade back then, I'd be the real life Arno. 
But yeah, overall, the parkour in this game is really fun. It looks great, and I like how there's a bit of a skill ceiling with it where you can get better at it. It feels like in the new games, there's no skill involved with parkour at all. You just have to hold a button, so it's nowhere near as engaging. And there's nothing to really learn or improve on. Unity's parkour definitely could have done with some more polishing to make it more responsive and fluid. If they had done that, no doubt it would have been almost perfect. I mean, add catch ledge back as well because break fall is completely random and doesn't always activate. That to me would make the ideal parkour system for Assassin's Creed. And it's too bad because rather than building on the parkour for Syndicate, they decide to strip away some of the player's control and make it more automated. Unity's stealth system is also another thing I know a lot of people really like about the game. However, like the parkour, it's nowhere near perfect. What I really enjoy about the stealth in this game though is it actually makes you feel like an assassin. I know, right? Feeling like an assassin while being an assassin in an Assassin's Creed game? What? <laughs> Take notes. <laughs> now, what do I mean by feeling like an assassin? Well, for starters, you get these awesome assassination animations, easily my favorite of the entire series. They're so stylish, brutal, but also very quick and clean. You can tell only a skilled assassin could pull off these moves like Arno. There's a lot of variety in the animations as well, and I like how the low profile assassinations are quick and subtle, so you can quickly move on after assassinating an enemy and get back into stealth. There's several different animations for the low profile assassinations, same with high profile assassinations, low profile double assassinations, high profile double assassinations, ledge assassinations, blending assassinations, and you have your air and double air assassinations as well. There are just so many ways to assassinate an enemy in this game that makes you feel like a badass assassin. This paired with the parkour and the new tools and projectile system where you can have one of each equipped at a time to make the most out of your assassin tools and ranged weaponry. The Phantom Blade is one of my favorite unique assassin weapons in the series. It kind of feels like a stealthy version of the hidden gun from the Ezio games. The design of it is so sick, I think it pairs with the hidden blade so well. You of course also get your berserk blades you can use to aggro enemies onto each other, or use it in more versatile ways, like using it to reset an enemy's detection meter for a stealthy assassination. That too, there's so many little cool tricks you can do with the stealth in this game. You can even use the pistol to stealthily take out those annoying ranged enemies from a distance, even if it makes a lot of noise. Then you have all your tools with the very overpowered smoke bombs that you can just abuse if you get a belt that can hold 15 of them, as well as stun grenades, cherry bomb lures, poison bombs, and money bags. There's also skills like disguise that allow you to temporarily break the animus and disguise as any nearby NPC. I loved using this feature, it's really strong and paired with the smoke bombs, it makes for an absolutely deadly combo. The tools and projectiles allow for a lot of versatility and creativity in your stealth encounters that make it feel like a true evolution of stealth in Assassin's Creed. Social stealth actually feels useful and encouraged in a lot of missions as well, with the crowd blending. There's just such an awesome feeling infiltrating a party, blending with the crowd, and assassinating a target in plain sight. It's what being an assassin is all about, and Unity captures that very well. However, like I said earlier, stealth is not perfect. The detection system in Unity can feel a bit wonky sometimes, and we're not talking Valhalla, instant spotting from 100 meters away wonky, but there were times in my playthrough where I'd be spotted through a wall, or someone who's nowhere near me is somehow alerted. And even enemies spotting me before they've even turned around. The cover system can also be very janky and the best way to exit cover smoothly is just by tapping the high profile or sprint button, which is something the game doesn't tell you. It can be really frustrating sometimes, but I enjoy the core of stealth with the animations, tools, projectiles, and social stealth, so when the stealth works, it feels incredible and it nails the feeling of being an assassin. The combat in this game is probably the most controversial part of the gameplay though. Some people love it, others absolutely hate it. I'm very mixed about it because on the one hand, I really like the weighty, realistic feel to it, and once again, the animations look great, including the finishers. I do quite like the new parry system with the staggering strike and heavy
heavy attacks and all that. However, the combat is very rough around the edges. It's easily the least polished combat system of the series, and it can feel very janky, unresponsive, and buggy. Sometimes Arno is just a phantom as he kills guards without even touching them. There are times where I'm pressing the attack button and Arno just won't listen. The game lacks a proper way to avoid gunfire. Yes, I know you're supposed to roll, but it doesn't even work all the time. There were times where I'd still get hit, even when rolling. That's clearly why they added a button to consistently dodge it in Syndicate. I think if they had something similar to AC3 system where you can use an enemy as a human shield, that would have been much better for Unity. It also doesn't help that guards can just aimbot you through crowds of people. It doesn't matter if there's a huge crowd between you and the bullet, it'll go right through them and hit you. The combat is also very unbalanced. You get all these unique, differing weapons and weapon types with different stylish animations, but the one-handed sword is so overpowered compared to the rest because it can do the same damage as all the heavy weapons, but it's just plain out faster. So you feel pressured into only using one-handed swords, and it ruins the point of having all these unique weapons and choices. That, and you can also just abuse Arno's one-shot kill combo where you parry into a staggering strike, knock an enemy on their back, and if you quick shot them with any projectile, even a berserk blade, it will one-shot them regardless of level or health. So again, like a lot of the gameplay, I think it looks great visually, but the combat can feel so clunky and buggy at times, it can be very frustrating to control. There's several enemy types in Unity. There are two groups with the French guards and the extremists who are Templar henchmen. There are five enemy types in total. The soldier, which is your regular enemy. Brutes, who do lots of damage and have good amounts of health. The watcher, which is the sniper enemies with extended vision but less health. The defender, which is the spear enemies. And the seekers and officers who are the more agile soldiers that can dodge your projectiles. There's not a ton of enemy variety, but for an Assassin's Creed game, that's pretty good. And each enemy has a unique quirk or ability about them that you need to keep in mind when approaching them in combat or stealth, as they each have different health pools and vulnerabilities. Assassin's Creed Unity has a pretty standard skill tree. You unlock skill points for completing main story missions, along with a few for doing co-op missions as well. There's ranged, combat, health, and stealth skill categories. They tried to make it feel like you could create your own build or play style in this game, which they didn't really do that well since stealth is such an essential part of the game. I don't really think you need to give people the freedom to create builds because it feels like a stealth game, which is kind of what Assassin's Creed has always been at heart. Not to mention, you'll pretty much be unlocking all the skills by the end of the game anyway, so there's no real difficult decisions to be made for which skills you want. It is nice how they spread out the unlocks as you progress through the game though, so you get a nice new mechanic or tool to play around with to refresh the experience late into the game. The customization is very interesting in this game. Like I said, they tried to make it so you could create your own build with the different gear stats and everything. I almost always go for the Sans Culette gear because it by far has the best stealth stats. However, I really hate how it looks visually, so I'll usually put an outfit on. I wish you could equip other gear pieces, but only visually like you can in the newer games, because I really like the look of a lot of the gear in this game, but they usually have bad stats, so I don't get to equip them. It is nice that you can equip an outfit over your gear. I just wish you could do the same thing with the regular gear as well, because I need to do that, especially when I'm mismatching to get the best stats possible. You can look like a total idiot in this game, but I appreciate the fact that at least you can't look like a futuristic, well, whatever this is. Generally speaking though, I do really like the look and style of the gear and the freedom to choose different color schemes, but this was the first game to introduce microtransactions in Assassin's Creed. The Helix credits can be bought with real life money and with Helix credits you can buy outfits, weapons, and even boosters in the game which is stupid for so many reasons. Thankfully the microtransactions are nowhere near as prevalent and invasive as they are in Odyssey and Valhalla, and even Origins for that matter.
but this is really the game that started us down that trend. At least unlike the newer games though, none of the gear or weapons is locked behind a paywall. You can still earn it by playing the game and getting in-game currency, so you can ignore the microtransactions. Again though, I see a lot of people say that, but simply ignoring the problem doesn't fix it. I may not buy any microtransactions, but it's still the principle of it that really bothers me. We're already paying for these games, there shouldn't be microtransactions, and there's no excuse for it. Not to mention the sly tactics Ubisoft uses, like starting you with some Helix credits to tempt you into buying more. The simple fact is, most full-price AAA single-player games like this don't use microtransactions and would never get away with it. The communities and fans would come down hard on whatever company that did, except for Ubisoft, I guess. I don't understand, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I don't like that Unity is the game that started this. Especially with the boost. The cosmetics, I mean, fine, whatever, I can live with it. But in-game boosts to give you better stealth, damage, health, and all sorts of things for a limited time? You can actually buy these with real money. That's basically pay to win. Like, come on, that just takes all the fun out of the game. I don't know why anybody would buy these. I already had some for free, I guess, since the game gives you some Helix credits, and I tried it once and I immediately stopped because it just sucked the fun and challenge out of the experience. Unity's progression and leveling system is a bit different from other games that have it in the series. I'm personally of the opinion that this game doesn't really need a leveling system, none of the older games have it, and it really doesn't do a whole lot of benefit for the game. I guess it's cool to see yourself rise in ranks and title, but again, I'm just personally not a fan of giving enemies different levels and all that. The leveling isn't as deep or prevalent as it is in Syndicate and the newer games, but I still think it could do without it. Generally speaking, gameplay in Unity has tons of ups and downs. I still think it has some of the best animations across the board in the series, and it really captures what it's like to be an assassin, when it works at least. I'm now going to be talking about spoilers here as I give my take on the story, so if you don't want any spoilers, skip to the next part, this video should be in chapters. But anyways, as I'm sure you all know, AC Unity's story picks up right where AC Rogue left off, which is uncommon for Assassin's Creed games to do, especially these days, so I thought that was pretty cool. What's also pretty cool is you get to see the consequences of Shay's action in full force, as the assassin he killed Charles Dorian at the end of AC Rogue is none other than Arno's father. You get to see what what kind of effect Shay's actions had on Arno's life, and how he basically ruined it and set Arno down a very difficult path. Again, all the more reason why I would have eventually liked to see Arno and Shay interact in some way, shape, or form, because I think Shay may have shown a bit of remorse if he knew what killing just a simple target would end up doing to a child he didn't even know existed. The problem is, though, you only get to understand this moment and scene with more insight if you've played Assassin's Creed Rogue first. Back when these games first came out, out, they came out on the same day of course, I played Unity first, having no idea that the games actually connect, even if it is very briefly. It adds a whole new element and feeling behind the beginning sequences with Charles's death. I remember being shocked when I played through Rogue for the first time, and realized it was Shay, as Unity doesn't really spend much time afterwards on the circumstances of Charles's death. But it's in this intro sequence where Arno will meet the love of his life Elise, and Francois de la Serre, the Templar Grand Master, who takes Arno Arno in and practically raises him as his own son. I think they could have done a better job showing the connection and bond De La Serre and Arno have, because De La Serre also dies very early on in the game, and Arno spends almost the entire story trying to avenge him. It would have been nice if we had more scenes between the two of them before he died, so it would make his death a little more impactful, and thus motivate the player to be more on board with Arno and seeking vengeance. Nonetheless, it's still made obvious that Francois De La Serre was a father figure to Arno, and his death impacted Arno heavily once again, just like with his own father as a child. And it doesn't help that in both scenarios, Arno carries a heavy burden of guilt. Both times his carelessness is what got both his father and pretty much adoptive father killed. In case it wasn't obvious, tragedy is a recurring theme throughout Unity's story, and for Arno specifically. Arno loses a lot of people, and lots of his growth and development in the story is how he changes and matures from those 
losses. But the main focus of the story is the love story between Arno and Elise. Ah, don't you just love love? The thing that sucks for mostly everyone. Yeah, it's great. It, it's great. What do you mean? I, I said it's great. I said it's great. I know a lot of people aren't fond of Unity's heavy focus on the love story, but for the most part, I understand why they did it, and I think it works quite well. If they were ever going to have the focus to be on a love story in one of these games, it makes sense for it to be the game that takes place in Paris. You know, city of love and all that. I think what bothers most people about it though is how Arno is always chasing after Elise and dropping everything to help her. He doesn't actually have much interest in being an assassin, he just wants to protect Elise and avenge Francois de la Serre, all while redeeming himself of his guilt for playing a part in de la Serre and his father's death. Let's be real, our boy Arno is a major simp. You're my doorman. While yes, he's definitely a simp, it's 100% intentional. Arno is written this way so that he can grow and mature into a Giga Chad assassin. No, but seriously, this is Arno's character arc. And while you may not like him as a simp, seriously, he's like a lost puppy as he constantly chases Elise. Elise, Elise, Elise. I think Germain did you a favor, Arno. Oh, okay, that got dark fast. It is necessary for him to be this way though, so that he can grow. Just like in real life, we are not all the best versions of ourselves and our experiences are what allows us to learn and grow. A character that is already perfect from the start with no flaws is just not interesting to watch. Which brings me to how I feel about Arno as a character, his journey, and how he stacks up to other protagonists in the series. Again, I think Arno has great character development, but the problem is, a lot of this takes place at the end of the game, and you don't get to see the result of that really until his monologue and the Dead Kings DLC, which I will be talking about in another video. But Arno grows in to quite the mature and likable assassin protagonist that you really want to root for. But his story isn't completed yet because Ubisoft never gave him a sequel, so it makes it quite impossible for him to stack up to protagonists like Ezio or even Altair for that matter. I think Arno is a character we can really empathize with. He makes lots of mistakes and he suffers a lot of tragedy. His father, De La Serre, Mirabeau, his one friend Bellic who he's brought to kill, and the one that breaks him, the only person who kept him from the suffering of being alone, Elise. Arno feels human, he feels relatable, and his story is quite heartbreaking. In a lot of ways, part of his character actually resonates with Altair. He's a very young yet extremely gifted assassin, and due to that, he's very disobedient and arrogant, always quick to go in for the kill without really thinking. For example, Arno killing the Templar Grand Master Lafreniere and putting Germain, the very person he's been looking for this whole time, directly in the seat of power without even realizing it. It's kind of like Altair being overly eager and attacking Robert de Sable at the beginning of AC1, leading to an invasion on Masyaf Castle and resulting in the deaths of many assassins. Arno's just lucky that the Creed has become a lot less cutthroat since the Third Crusade. Because back in Altair's day, this was the consequence of disobedience. Well, all Arno gets is a stern talking to? Kids these days, they get it so easy, I swear. And clearly that stern talking to wasn't enough because Arno just basically goes off on his own, killing whatever target he wants in pursuit of Germain, and then he's somehow surprised when he's exiled. It's clearly just who he is, as he didn't listen to his father as a child either. I think Arno was a protagonist with a lot of potential, and the smart thing to do would have been to continue Arno's story in a sequel, but Ubisoft just couldn't help themselves. Aside from Arno though, there's a fairly strong cast of supporting characters. Pierre Bellic is one of the most interesting assassin characters. An old school ruthless assassin who believes violence and war is the only way to bring peace, and that diplomacy with the Templars will never last. He poisons Mirabeau and wants to purge the rest of the council with Arno's help in order to build the creed anew and bring it back to what it was. Obviously, Arno believes diplomacy and peace is possible, after all, he was raised by the Templar our Grand Master. Bellic was also a good friend to Arno's father, so it makes that final battle between the two feel so climactic and suspenseful, one of, if not my favorite moments in the game for sure. Where Arno has no choice but to kill Bellic to avenge Mirabeau and protect Elise. The real kicker to all of this though is by the end of the game you think back and wonder, maybe Bellic was right. The Creed has gone too soft and Elise effectively poisoned Arno's mind, always causing him to make irrational decisions. Bellic and his 
story is very unique and one I personally really enjoyed. Now, it's time to talk about the big baddie of this game, Thomas Germain. In the grand scheme of the series, Germain is a pretty forgettable antagonist. I'm personally still thinking it would have been better to have Shay as the antagonist, or at least give him somewhat of a proper role, especially since you think he would have had a hand in the French Revolution based on his line from the end of Rogue. And perhaps we shall start a revolution of our own. But regardless, we got Germain, who doesn't really have much presence in the story. He has a minimal amount of screen time for being the main antagonist of the story, and when you first meet him, he's seemingly a captive silversmith. But then not too long after, you get this plot twist that he was actually the orchestrator of De La Serre's murder all along. It feels like this was meant to be a big reveal, but it happened so early on, and with a character that we've only seen for like two minutes, so it hardly feels as shocking or impactful as it probably should. Again, if you had more more screen time prior to that plot twist, perhaps it would have been more effective. Not only that, but I feel he's missing a lot of the moral complexity or intrigue that make antagonists like Haven Kenway so interesting. I'm not saying an antagonist has to be complex to be a good villain, but Germain's motivations and personality are just so bland. He wants to rebuild the Templar Order and bring it back to what Jacques de Molay's order was. I mean, that's cool, but there's not much else to him. He's more meant to be an object of Arno and Elise's vengeance, rather rather than a strong, compelling antagonist. So yeah, in the grand scheme of the series, he's certainly one of the most boring and forgettable villains for me personally. One of my favorite parts about Unity's story though is the presence of the Assassin's Creed. You know, the title of the series? The Creed is an integral part of the story. We get to see the induction ceremony thing where Arno drinks, well, whatever that is. <laughs> get to see how the Creed welcomes initiates, how they assign assassination targets, and the more political side of things where the Council are often arguing about how best to deal with the Templars and the Crown. Unity was the first time in a while we saw a fully functioning Creed with lots of assassins and an actual Council. It's different from the kind of Creed we're used to, but it makes sense since this is France and it's centuries after Altair and Ezio. I loved how assassin heavy and focused this felt. It was definitely needed, especially after playing as a Templar in Rogue. I also love the focus on history. They did a great job weaving an Assassins versus Templar conflict into the Revolution, where you get to see a lot of historic locations and events, like the King's execution, the storming of the Bastille, and even providing its own spin on why Robespierre ended up being executed, because Arno and Elise thoroughly discredit him. I thought it was really fun, and like I've said countless times before, history is a big reason why I fell in love with the series in the first place. I thought it was especially awesome that we got to see the burning of Jacques de Molay and the destruction of the Knights Templar in the 1300s. Again, I still want a game set during that time period, that would be so cool. Unity's modern day storyline is definitely the story's weakest link though. It's so vague and honestly pretty pointless, it feels like it was just there because it had to be since this is Assassin's Creed and they didn't really know what to do with it. You never actually get to step out of the animus in the modern day, and essentially all the modern day is is every once in a while you'll be pulled out of France and thrown into some set piece in another time period. Now admittedly, some of those set pieces and locations look great and stick out in my memory, with the Eiffel Tower during World War II and the castle during the Crusades, but when you really think about it, this modern day is nothing more than meaningless filler. Nothing that ever happens in it is ever brought up again. It doesn't progress the overall plot in any way, and Sean is in it as a voice, and that's about the only callback and continuity with the other modern day stories storylines. Not only that, but it breaks up the pacing of the main story when you're just randomly pulled out to do a helix section. The set pieces and locations were cool, but the story is practically non-existent and pointless, and just there so the game has some form of modern day. Literally, the whole point of it in the first place was to find Germain's body, since he's a sage Abstergo could use, but at the end, Bishop is just like, nah, the Templars will never find his body down there. All good. Uh, I don't think Abstergo will bother searching the catacombs for Germain's body. The bones are going to be too damaged, too decayed. We're in the clear with this sage. You did good work, initiate. So what was the point of this in the first place then? Oh well, whatever. The story definitely has its highs and lows. Generally though, I quite like Arno's journey and he's a pretty good protagonist in my eyes, who definitely needed a sequel to be more fleshed out.
As I'm sure you know, one of the most unique qualities about Assassin's Creed Unity is it remains the only AC game to this day to have co-op. Other games had multiplayer, but Unity is the only one where you and some friends or randoms can explore the same world and complete missions together. For this reason alone, I think a lot of people tend to gravitate towards Unity, and it's a great time to play with friends. Well, when it works anyway, because the bugs and issues are about 30 times worse than single player in co-op. <laughs> Where they at? They are you? Well, they just killed Mikey! <laughs> what? Mikey dead. is dead! Who's attacking me, bro? They're all dead! What do you mean? There's like nine of them alive still! Dude, I, they're, they're, they're on like top of me, apparently. Yeah, I'm getting I hit! I see them! I see Who's them! Who's getting hit? I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting smoked, I'm getting smoked, bro! I'm dead! I do believe a decent amount of people still play co-op on this game, so it's not too hard to queue up with randoms, but uh, trying to do stealth with randoms is actually impossible. There's always that one guy who will just rush in and get spotted. At least with your friends, you can at least try to coordinate and look cool, though this is still likely to happen. Well Bruh. Spend all the time clearing the bomb just for Mikey to go straight to the top. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I feel the other side of That paired with all the bugs and co-op can be a frustrating time. With that said, it's still really fun. I mean, it's co-op in Assassin's Creed. It's a ton of fun, and there's some great co-op missions and heists made specifically for multiple players. And if you don't have people to play with, you can always try randoms, or some of them they let you play by yourself. There's also some skills in the game that were made specifically for co-op, like shared eagle vision and group healing. This mode is so fun, and it's such a shame it wasn't given enough time in the oven to straighten out all the issues and bugs, because it's pretty broken as it is. I really hope they bring back co-op one day, don't get me wrong, I'll always want them to focus on the single player experience first and foremost, but playing Assassin's Creed with friends is just a great time. But for now, that's something that will remain completely unique to AC Unity. Assassin's Creed Unity is very rough around the edges. It's broken, buggy, unbalanced, with weird design choices, and I absolutely love it. The core experience with the gameplay is so much fun. It makes the Assassin's dream come true. The world is incredibly immersive and atmospheric with great detail and historical accuracy. There's quality side content and of course co-op. The story isn't perfect, but still pretty underrated in my opinion, and Arno is a good protagonist to me. There's no better time to play play AC Unity as this will be the best state the game has ever been in, and if you haven't played it yet and you like Assassin's Creed and stealth games in general, I implore you to try it. A lot of people who've given the game another chance since launch have ended up really enjoying it and have a complete 180 in their opinion on it. I'm someone who's defended this game from the start, check any video I did, well, oh, shut up, that one doesn't count. While the game may be rough around the edges, on the inside, it's a diamond. Thank you guys for watching this review of Assassin's Creed Unity. This has been a long time coming. I've had many opinions on Unity for a long time, so it feels really good to finally get it all off my chest in one video. I hope you enjoyed the longer review. I don't know if I'll be doing this for every game, but just the games where I really want to go into greater detail. I am going to review the Dead Kings DLC and Syndicate as well as the next in line for the series. London, baby! So stay tuned for that. Also, I've said this before, but I don't think everyone saw me say this, but for those of you who've been wanting me to rank all the AC games, I will eventually. I'm waiting to replay and review every Assassin's Creed game first, so the ranking will come whenever I eventually replay and review Valhalla, so don't worry, we'll get there eventually. Again, thank you for watching, consider leaving a like on the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribing to the channel if you're new. Also, feel free to check out some of my past videos on AC Unity if you'd like. I also now have channel memberships here, so consider joining if you'd like with the join button and next to my channel or with the link in the description. Shout out to my mentors. I really appreciate the support and have a great rest of your day, everyone.